us that there's 80. Okay, maybe we can wait a couple of minutes just to let people mm -hmm. join. Are we still private? Oh, yeah. yeah, we were just waiting, but I think uh, you know it's it's a, a really good amount exactly of of attendance. So let's let's get started. So um, good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar: Social Determinants uh, of Health in Diabetes Care. I am Dr. Elisabetta Patrona. I'm a physician, a pharmacopidemiologist, and associate professor of medicine at Brigham Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. I'm also the chair of the Public Health and Epidemiology Interest Group at the ADA, and I will be one of the two moderators for today's webinar. So this webinar has been developed uh, and hosted by the American Diabetes Association Public Health and Epidemiology Interest Group. The group comprises of over 1,500 members and aims to increase public awareness of the epidemiology of diabetes and its complications and focus efforts on health promotion and community health strategies. So my co-moderator today is Dr. Sonia Howe, who organized this webinar. So thank you so much, Sonia. Uh, Sonia, would you like to maybe welcome our attendees, introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm very excited for our two speakers today. Um, I'm Sonia Ha. I'm an endocrinologist at Emory University and assistant professor um, in the Department of Medicine there, and happy to be a part of the interest group and uh, looking forward to our two speakers. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So before I introduce our first speaker today, I would like just to um, a couple of quick reminders. So um, if you have any questions for the presenters, you can click on the Q&A feature uh, to the right of the video stream uh, and type in your question. And we will be addressing questions at the end of the session today. Um, if you would like to make a general comments, you can also use the comment feature and just type in your comment uh, during the, the presentation or during the Q&A. So uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce our first presenter for today, Dr. Shivani Agarwal. So Dr. Agarwal is Associate Director of the Pleasure Institute for Diabetes and Metabolism, Director of Type 1 Diabetes Programs, Director of the Supporting Emerging Adults with Diabetes Program, and an Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine Mortefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, New York. Extending from her clinical focus, Dr. Agarwal's research concentrates on clinical and behavioral interventions in young adults with type 1 diabetes, as well as racial and socioeconomic disparities in type 1 diabetes, especially with regards to use of diabetes technology and incorporating social determinants of health into diabetes care delivery and research. Uh, Dr. Agarwal serves on the ADA Healthcare Disparities Committee, the Endocrine Society's Innovative Models in Diabetes Care Task Force, and the Advocacy and Public Outreach Core Committee. So it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Agarwal, and it is further um, uh, delayed that I will now turn it over to her. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. Um, I'm very, very excited to be here uh, to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart and to learn from Dr. Chin as well, um, who you'll hear about next and learn from you. So let me just share my talk right away. Um, okay. And I'm assuming, can people see my talk? Okay, so I will get right to it. Um, so. I am um, an endocrinologist. I forgot to say that in my bio. I'm an endocrinologist, um, but I <clears throat> have a public health background as well. So I really, I think, think of uh, healthcare delivery as a system. Um, and if we kind of change the system and modify the system, both within healthcare and beyond healthcare, then I think we actually can impact patient outcomes better. So I hope I'm speaking to a friendly crowd here. Um, okay, these are my disclosures. 
All right, so um, social vulnerability, what does it mean? So there are kind of a lot of terms um, surrounding social determinants of health, social vulnerability. And I thought that I would go through this just quickly because the CDC uses this definition. So social vulnerability means a number of factors that weaken a community's ability to prevent human suffering and financial loss in a disaster. So it was really for um, governmental organizations to do disaster preparedness. And there are several factors, which I can go, I'll go through, but that include poverty, lack of access to transportation, crowded housing, race, ethnicity is one of them. So the CDC actually uses the US census data to determine what's called the social vulnerability index for every census tract in the country. And they rank based on these 15 social factors and they make maps. So I included the maps, some of the maps on the right, and you can see the darker shading um, is, is this, uh, and the scale below. Um, and it's really interesting to kind of think about how to use these maps, both for planning, but also for resource allocation. And I think really the CDC kind of helps with these maps, helps governmental organizations actually do resource allocation. So they're pretty important. Um, so, sorry. Okay. So these are the 15 um, kind of SVI social vulnerability variables um, from the American Community Survey, survey or what's called the the census, the US census, and they're categorized into four related themes. So there's socioeconomic status, which is um, includes below poverty, unemployed, income level, and, um, and a lack of a high school diploma, so education. <clears throat> there's household composition and disability. So those who are age 65 or older are considered more vulnerable, age 17 or younger are children, um, civilians with disabilities and single parent households. Minority status and language. So minority has changed its meaning uh, over the years um, with research and, and advocacy and the way that our, our, the demographics of this country are changing. Um, so that definition somewhat keeps changing. And then speaks um, English um, uh, per this grading less than well. And then housing and transportation. So there's uh, multi-unit structures, mobile homes, crowding, um, not having a vehicle and group quarters, which are all known to um, create vulnerabilities for health. So another way to think about these social vulnerability factors is through social determinants of health, which I think most of us have heard now, um, but I will go through it really quickly. So the, um, the Kind of healthy people initiative talked about social determinants of health as, as these um, the conditions in the environment where people are born live learn work play worship and age that affect a wide range of health um, quality of life outcomes functioning risks for disease and mortality and so the social determinants of health can be really grouped into five domains so they include economic stability education access and quality healthcare access and quality neighborhood and built environment, which can include walkability indexes, um, access to healthy food um, and um, violence, you know, neighborhood violence, and then social and community contexts, which is um, I think being fleshed out how to study that or how to even define that, um, but is very, very important for um, providing safety nets for our vulnerable communities. So, um, how could social vulnerability affect diabetes? So I think some of it is some of this is pretty obvious for those of us that care for people with diabetes or have you know uh, um, interacted with people with diabetes. But I thought I would go through this in a little bit of depth and kind of add some flavor to this. So for economic stability, obviously, if someone cannot um, <clears throat> is not employed or has under is underemployed, has you know income issues, income um, instability has a lot of expenses, you know, they're going to the hospital all the time because they're in DKA or, you know, they have complications, they have amputations, they're going to go in debt. That's just going to keep this vicious cycle of economic instability, medical bills file, um, sorry, medical bills pile up. Um, and you can imagine for someone with bills uh, who cannot pay them, they're not only not going to be able to possibly afford um, their medications that they need to ma manage their diabetes, They're not gonna be able to afford the food and whatever else, other self-management, you know, materials, kind of material needs that they have. But they also may be afraid to go and seek medical care again and get another bill. So this is huge and has kind of implications across the spectrum, as you can imagine. 
neighborhood and physical environment. So a lot has been um, studied on the built, the, the kind of the built environment is another way to think about this. Um, so housing, <clears throat> you know, even just as small as people not wanting to um, show how they manage their diabetes with insulin, you know, insulin is a very visual way of, of showing that you have diabetes. And if you're in a crowded housing situation, you don't really want to do that. So you don't take your insulin. Um, down to obviously with COVID, you know, there's been issues with being able to, um, to actually isolate yourself or your isolate yourself from others. Um, and we know that that has large implications for diabetes outcomes. Transportation, if you can't get anywhere um, or it's too expensive to get to your, your medical appointments, you can't get medical care. Um, now, obviously with virtual delivery, it's become a little easier, but again, if you have a crowded housing situation, then you can't actually get a quiet room to even be able to do your televisit. So again, there's a kind of other kind of advanced complications of all of these issues. Safety is a huge one. If you wanna go walk outside, but it's not a safe environment, you can't do that. Um, parks, playgrounds, all the walkability um, kind of factors are important here. And then, um, well, food we'll talk about separately because food is, is just so much part of diabetes. Education, so <clears throat> literacy, um, you know, literacy issues, we have a lot of really amazing treatments in diabetes, but they are quite complicated. And I do a lot of work on diabetes technologies. So continuous glucose monitors and insulin pumps. I think that uh, our kind of teaching materials are still way above like a third or even eighth grade level um, of, of literacy. Um, and they're complicated concepts. They're not easy to understand. I think there's ways, very easy ways to make them understandable. But right now, I don't think that kind of we're helping our patients with literacy, um, with literacy limitations. Language, obviously, will be a huge limitation, both for um, delivering care, talking about therapeutics, but also even trust in, in kind of the, the patient provider relationships that we have with our patients. Um, and, um, and I think it's really important to have access to, you know, interpreter services, um, ASL services, things like that. <clears throat> um, and then early childhood education, vocational training, higher education. I mean, this, these all kind of lead to economic stability, um, uh, but also kind of higher quality of life. Um, diabetes can get in the way of, you know, even people reaching those milestones, even if they have opportunities to do that. Um, so understanding how that affects diabetes and how diabetes affects education is very important. Food is, you know, the cornerstone of diabetes management. Um, so obviously hunger, um, you know, food insecurity, just from a, um, from a quantity perspective, but also quality perspective, as we know, is very important. And um, there are a lot of programs now to kind of help with food insecurity, um, but whether those programs are, um, replicatable or, or, you know, can be disseminated across various settings is, is I think still to be determined. <clears throat> Community and social context. So this is kind of what I was talking or alluding to before. Um, there are, there's stress and there's community stress. Um, and that really, I think, plays a part in how communities access medical care, have relationships with their healthcare institutions that they're close to, or the, you know, um, the, the solo practitioners down the street. Um, but also just providing safety nets for people. You know, it may not just be families um, and, and extended families that provide support for patients with diabetes, but it's also uh, neighbors, you know, other kind of extended family members, um, you know, the, the, the shop down the street. And so there's, there's these larger community kind of supports that really need to be there. Um, and also just, I think, for kind of emotional support of living with diabetes, which is not to be underestimated. And then uh, last but not least, the healthcare system. So um, obviously, um, like I've been talking about before, kind of provider characteristics of being culturally um, competent, also linguistic abilities, um, you know, for different languages, the quality of care that, that people receive, even if they do go to care is important. So whether there's not only just access to specialists, but whether those relationships that are really have to be developed on trust whether they're there for specialists versus primary care providers. I, I'm particularly interested in that um, and, and seeing how that affects um, our ability to support our patients and for them to feel confident in accepting new therapies. And then obviously, you know, insurance coverage is a huge, is a huge deal for diabetes. So as you can imagine, social determinants of health, 
have very indirect, have many different ways of really um, affecting outcomes. And you can imagine that it's very complicated when you look at potential mediators and moderators of the effect on outcomes. Um, they can, you know, there's, there's mediators of knowledge and self-care behaviors all going from kind of adherence all the way through monitoring, healthy diet, knowledge, um, access to care, obviously really important. <clears throat> and then processes, just the processes of care and whether people are able to um, do their annual screenings and get access to those screenings and get covered for those screenings is really important. Um, and all of those obviously have, you know, really important um, uh, effects on health outcomes, both, you know, clinical outcomes, but also um, just psychosocial outcomes like quality of life. So um, there are a million facts on social determinants in diabetes, but these are ones that I particularly um, kind of carry with me and are very uh, powerful for me. Um, so I thought I'd read through them a little bit. So uh, this is um, from one paper by, by uh, or a lot of these from reviews now, but <clears throat> those with lower socioeconomic position are more likely to develop type two diabetes, experience more complications and die sooner than those with higher socioeconomic positions. We know this. Compared with high income, people in middle income have a 40% higher diabetes prevalence. And, and what they're what they kind of these authors coded as near poor had a 74% higher prevalence than those with higher income, and the poor had a hundred percent higher prevalence. And scarily, <clears throat> um, though there are actually widening disparities from the previous time period. So we are not helping, we are not fixing things, it's they're actually getting worse. Um, diabetes incidence is two times higher with, you know, a less than high school education compared to a higher school at high school education, um, for housing insecurity, 30% of individuals with diabetes in community health centers report housing instability. And there are five times, those that report housing instability are five times more likely to have an emergency department visit or a hospitalization for diabetes. So really linking social determinants, social determinants of health with hard outcomes, um, and then I particularly like this one because I'm from New York City, um, so I'm a little biased, but, um, but it's important to think about, again, kind of outside health sectors with inside health. Um, New York City residents who live continuously in areas with greater ratios of healthy to unhealthy food establishments and areas where there's higher walkability, they not only were able to achieve lower A1C, but they also took less time to achieve target A1C versus least less advantaged areas. And this was across, um, across income level, across race, ethnicity. So, you know, the environments in which we live are really important, not only to current health, but to achieving kind of target health in the future with interventions. Um, so there is a lot of amazing literature out there now, um, has been in the past, but really now, um, uh, I think the conversations have sharpened. I think that um, I, at least myself, and Dr. Chin may, may have been doing this from before, he's such a leader in the field, but um, the conversations to me have sharpened in the literature. We've been able to say a lot more about really what needs to be changed, including um, systemic racism, including <clears throat> issues in our healthcare systems and policies that really don't, don't target equity, so they perpetuate inequity. Um, so I just included kind of three different kind of reviews or perspectives that I find particularly compelling and that I think uh, everyone should read, honestly. Um, the one is from, um, it's a, a scientific review from the ADA um, that Felicia Hill Briggs led. Um, another is a perspective in JCM um, from Sharita Hill Golden, really talking about um, this issue of systemic racism and kind of historical um, racism through the, the years. And then um, Griffin Rogers, who is the head of the NIDDK, really talked about how we have to address upstream factors in, um, in diabetes to impact health disparities. Okay. Um, okay, so really just high level take home points. I hope that I, you know, I hope that this is clear. There are inequities in living and working conditions and environments that really do have impact on biological and behavioral outcomes. Life course exposure and the length of time spent living in these resource deprived environments matters. Um, and so we have to think about changing the environment in which people live. And then race, place, and poverty really do converge in very complex ways. Um, and so we really have to try to tangle that apart um, more in the field to understand really how to impact outcomes and, and help people. Um, 
So uh, this is my, one of my favorite quotes, um, of all the forms of inequality, injustice and health is the most shocking and the most inhuman um, from, from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I really feel like there's some things I, I, I wake up, sometimes I wake up and I say, how is any of this going to change? How much control do I actually have, right? Um, but I feel like at least in healthcare, as, me, as an endocrinologist and in my office, I do have some control. So, um, so I, I wanted to focus a little bit on healthcare quickly. Um, so <clears throat> we all know COVID <laughs> um, has, has really, I think, blown the lid off of these inequalities that have been there for a long time. Um, and also not just uncovered and uh, unmasked these things, but also really worsen them um, and for, I don't, you know, decades to come. Um, like I've mentioned before, there is a lot of kind of structural and healthcare racism, and we are not immune in the healthcare system at all. Um, and we are, you know, as, as healthcare providers, a, um, a product of the societies and the upbringing up, and our upbringing. And so um, we are human and, and therefore we also are kind of not immune to this. Um, um, and so I just also, I think as a kind of example of what uh, happens um, with all of these kind of healthcare um, inequities, healthcare delivery inequities, I wanted to just talk quickly about young adults with type one who are who's really the, my, the population, my target population um, in my research. So we kind of early on in this process really looked at um, racial ethnic inequity um, in young adults, and again, unsurprisingly, but but at the time, really was kind of new data, saw really really big disparities in A1C. Um, so if you see on the in the graph, kind of um, non-Hispanic, white, and Hispanic um, uh, young adults had <clears throat> similar but not the same A1Cs, and then non-Hispanic black young adults had much much higher A1Cs. And this is a national study, kind of looking at young adults both in pediatric and adult care. Uh, both in primary care and in endocrine care, so kind of across the spectrum. Um, and then when we looked kind of further into why, right, what kind of factors contributed to these A1C disparities, luckily we were able to, we, I, we really kind of did a big search um, of the factors. We didn't actually use the EMR, we used surveys and, and interviews, so we had a lot, of, a lot more data than we're used to having. Um, but you can see from the graph on the left that of the total disparity between non-Hispanic black and white young adults, treatment regimen, although was second as a kind of a leading cause, a second leading cause of this disparity in A1C. Socioeconomic status was the first, which we know. But treatment regimen, again, from my locus of control, I say, well, wait a second, what can we do about that? So when we actually looked a little further into this, you can see on the, um, the right-hand panel that um, rates of insulin pump and CGM use were dramatically higher in non-Hispanic white versus non-Hispanic black and Hispanic. And by the way, all of the sites that were studied had full in, uh, insurance coverage for these technologies. So um, this was uh, something we kind of just pulled the thread on. And when we looked further into what might be contributing to these disparities in insulin pump and CGM use among these kind of between these race ethnicity groups, we disappointingly did not see any change in the rates, except a little bit in CGM, when we adjusted for things like um, uh, um, care setting, um, insurance coverage, um, what else, we just did a lot, psychosocial characteristics, history of DKA, recurrent DKA, uh, visit, visit frequency. So what, what I kind of take away from this was we probably have, a lot of work to do at the kind of patient provider level and understanding what conversations and what perceptions, uh, what conversations are happening and at, at the clinic level, at kind of at the patient level and what the perceptions are. And so we looked through, um, we did some qualitative work with young adults with type one in these kind of care circumstances, looking at how conversations or how interactions with healthcare providers, <clears throat> um, in this case, uh, affected their ability or, or their desire to take on technologies. Um, again, I think this can actually be applicable to many different circumstances. And what we found was potentially exacerbating factors of these kind of disparities in insulin pump and CGM use were really based on the lack of shared decision-making between providers and these young adults. 
and some preferences and biases of the young adults that were never discussed. They were just never discussed. Um, and potentially alleviating factors of these disparities in use um, to make people more likely to use these technologies was provider optimism. So really just saying to a, a patient, this may actually change your quality of life, right? Like we actually may be able to help you instead of the doomsday talk, you know, that, that, that happens. Tailoring of the information to that specific patient's um, uh, situation. You go into DK all the time because it's really hard to take your long acting insulin. Well, a pump actually just gives it to you, you know, all the time. So maybe that's actually great for you. Um, patient knowledge of benefit was very important. And then obviously insurance coverage is important, but as more and more of these technologies and therapeutics and, you know, oral medications and injectable medications are covered, we still have some work to do because, you know, without insurance, with insurance, there's still issues. All right. So what can we do? So I'm almost done. I think I'm running behind, so I will speed it up. So I, I kind of have redesigned, I think we need to redesign or reframe the way that we think about diabetes care to really think about it in the socio-ecological model of another, of an, at another level under public policy and society and social determinants and individual factors. And all of the things that we study and the way we think about our patients should really be contextualized in this socio-ecological model to impact diabetes outcomes. And so what can you do? Um, what can I do as an individual? This is kind of I, how I think about it. So I have this framework called St it's Standardize, Individualize, Act, and Advocate. Um, and so what I did was a bunch of things over the years to feel like I could do something about this problem. So we um, have at the Fleischer Institute, we have four sites across the Bronx in very, very under-resourced um, areas and communities and marginalized communities. So we recognized very quickly, we looked at our own data and recognized very quickly that one of our sites was getting kind of like the Cadillac care for the same types of patients in the same medical center than our other three sites. And so we um, painstakingly standardized our care across all four sites. We're still working on it, but we painstakingly did that in order to improve the outcomes. We also teamed up with the T1D Exchange QI Collaborative to help us kind of do um, our processes of care and standardization kind of in an iterative and um, more, more um, systematic way. And so that has been really, really successful for us. I also think you, at the same time as standardizing, you have to individualize. So for people who with unique needs, you need to individualize their care. Um, and so what we did, <clears throat> what we've been doing is EPIC um, for people who use the EPIC electronic medical record. We've been doing social determinants of health screening with their EPIC, with their screen um, across the, the, the system. They've started doing it in primary care and general peds, and now we're doing an endocrine. And it has been a boon for us to understand really what issues, what domains of social determinants of health our patients are facing. Um, we also have the, the SEED program, which I direct, um, and um, it's specific young adult care. So we're really trying to individualize needs for our vulnerable communities. The other thing we did, and it, what I did, was act. So I think there's, there's many ways you can act. I do one small thing every day that I see someone. Even if you do one small thing, it makes a difference because you're focused on equity. But I also act through my research. And I really, um, I don't have time to talk about it today, unfortunately, but we have a lot of um, ongoing studies, new, new grants that are looking at new care models, community health workers to promote diabetes technologies, um, psychologists delivering telemedicine, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy targeted diabetes distress. So we think that maybe improving psychological outcomes related to diabetes will actually improve medical outcomes. Um, so, you know, any way to kind of stretch the clinical models that we have, I think is important. And then advocacy, I think we can advocate to our hospital systems to um, think about their policies that may be perpetuating inequity, um, we are in talks with our health insurers um, to provide them data that's showing that their policies are actually causing a lot of inequity. And to them, it's like a surprise because they think they're helping, but they're not. Surprise, surprise for us. Um, but anyway, we actually are in talks with our health insurers and they actually have open ears to this now. Um, obviously, you know, um, talking on the Hill is important and our um, New York State Department of Health has actually been very friendly towards our institution. So we're trying to become uh, better advocates there as well. Um, so I, I have a, tons of people to acknowledge, which I won't have time to talk about today, but I could not do anything without them. 
Um, I hope that you enjoyed this and I'm excited to hear what Dr. Chin is doing um, in the interventions piece. And I hope this kind of set him up for his talk. So thank you. Thanks so, thanks so much, um, Dr. Agarwal. So um, it is my pleasure now to um, introduce our second speaker for today, uh, Dr. Marshall Chin. So Dr. Chin is the uh, Richard Parillo Family Professor of, of Healthcare Ethics in the Department of Medicine at the University of Chicago. Uh, he's a practicing general internist and health services researcher who has dedicated his career to advancing health equity through interventions at individual, organizational, community, and policy levels. He currently partners with eight urban and rural communities to integrate medical and social care to reduce diabetes disparities through the Merck Foundation Bridging the Gap program. He co-directs the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translation Research, the Robert Hood Johnson Foundation Advancing Health Equity Program, and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network Health Equity Advisory Team. Dr. Chin was a co-author of the 2020 ADA Scientific Review of Social Determinants of Health and Diabetes, and he was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2017. So um, welcome, Dr. Chin. Uh, very, uh, very happy to have you here. Thank you for being here. And I would now turn it over to you. Thanks so much for the generous introduction, Elisabetta. And a great talk, Shivani, and a wonderful introduction to this overall topic of diabetes and social determinants of health. So about uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I met with Beth Lacey. She's an assistant professor and early stage investigator at the University of Kentucky. There's a program in the NIH Clinical Translational Science Award program where you would have visiting scholars who are early stage investigators. And so she was a visiting speaker at the University of Chicago, did a, a wonderful talk. Her area is, is diabetes epidemiology, type one and older persons. And then she had a series of meetings with a variety of faculty. And so we had a great hour long discussion where we talked a little bit about our research and then spent a fair amount of time talking about emerging issues emerging research areas within equity, as well as like just general career advice. And so uh, I had seen Shivani's slides a couple of days ago, and so I knew that she was going to give a fantastic talk and in, in, in overview. So I don't want to duplicate um, what, what she covered. And I thought that what might be most interesting, um, I was also asked to have kind of a, a healthcare centric uh, vantage point for my talk. And so I will define health equity in social terms of health. I'll briefly orient you to do a couple of the uh, major SDOH reviews, and then spend most of the time really on sort of what I would call the, the, the emerging issues. So sort of raise what, um, what I think maybe some of the emerging SDOH related research questions and issues, and uh, have some suggestions for you, which we can go into during discussion in more detail. And then I'll end with some specific diabetes uh, SDOH healthcare system intervention examples, uh, making it come alive in terms of like actual, actual projects. So just quick definitions. I, I like this Robert Wood Johnson Foundation graphic uh, demonstrating the difference between equality and equity. The top half, every person gets the same size bicycle, no matter their physical situation, no matter their needs. The bottom representing equity, each person gets the appropriate vehicle to maximize their potential function. The World Health Organization definition of equity, first part talks about differences then among different socially defined groups, uh, whether it's socially defined, economically, demographically, or geographically, differences in quality care, differences in, in outcomes. Uh, and what I like about this definition also is that they add the, 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 the social justice component. So they say health inequities therefore involve more than inequality with respect to health determinants, access to the resources needed to improve and maintain health or health outcomes. They also entail a failure to avoid or overcome inequalities that infringe on fairness and human rights norms. And Shivani went over this definition of social terms of health, which also raises some of the social justice issues. And in the ADA SDOH review, they, they give us examples, four or five different frameworks. And um, uh, Shivani shared one of them, the Healthy People 2021 from the US uh, I'm going to um, give, you, give you a little more detail about the World Health Organization one. Um, one general point is that there's a lot of similarities across the models. This is a lot of overlap 
among the models, there are some differences. And so you would pick the one that, or adapt one that is most relevant to your purpose. These are the World Health Organization dimensions, which will map pretty closely to the five different dimensions that Shivani did for the Healthy People 2030. The point I want to raise about this is that the factors, they, they, they differ, they have a different feel of them. Uh, and, and, and remember this as we go back later on to uh, sort of emerging questions in the field. So you look at that first one, socioeconomic and political context. So this is very macro. So big P policy in terms of governmental policy, social policies regarding something like labor or housing, public policies. Um, in contrast to something in the same bucket, but different. So cultural values, societal values, something like um, our, our society's views towards race, for example. Uh, the second group, socioeconomic positions. So in some ways this is your SES variable in a data set in terms of uh, individuals um, SES position. Uh, the third bucket, again, another sort of entity on its own, social cohesion, social capital, something like trust in the community, for example, it's a, it's a different animal than, than the things we've talked about beforehand. Uh, the fourth is very concrete. So material circumstances, like the, the quality of your housing, for example, do you have the ability to buy uh, healthy food, uh, as Shivani had mentioned, and then the, the last box, uh, healthcare access or access to high quality care. So remember this, because I think that um, one of the themes in my talk is that too often we've been imprecise in, in research and intervention. You know, social terms have held a very general vague term or a social variable in a data set. Uh, whereas this, even the World Health Organization, there's this a lot of complexity, a lot of nuance and some very different types of factors uh, that um, fall under the general category of social determinants of health. So here's a framework for just the wider healthcare system. So healthcare systems, central lens, and equity and SDOH. So you see at the far right, the in some ways two of the ones relevant for today's talk. So it's money. So money is very important. So the point about like, um, oh, like in Shivani's talk, she talked a little bit about why certain things are funded or not, or already in chat, there was a question about something like pancreatic transplants and why, why isn't there more of that? Which money is one of the issues. Uh, but when you talk about payment reform, it's important not just to say, well, we're just going to do payment reform, but be very explicit about it being payment reform that supports and incentivizes specific care transformations that address medical and social needs and advance health equity. So that is connecting the dot aspect to it. The overall topic goes well with this, uh, the bottom one there, cross-sectoral partnerships addressing medical and social drivers of health. Another distinction is between individual drivers for an individual patient in front of us, and then these structural drivers at a wider structural community level, related but different. If you look at the overall the diagram, a lot of this just does not happen unless we're intentional about advancing health equity, intentional about addressing social terms of health. The middle, you see this implementing roadmap to reduce disparities. Typical healthcare approaches, look at your data, see where there are inequities, like black white differences, for example, like Shivani shared some of her data, for example, do a root cause analysis and Shivani gave a partial uh, root cause analysis of, in, in her situation of like why there are these disparities in quality care and outcomes, and then design and implement the care of interventions that are specifically tailored to address the root causes driving the disparities in your particular situation. The far left there, you see a part that I think is often underemphasized, which is creating culture of equity. You can do all these technical things, but unless there's a culture of equity, unless people truly care and prioritize equity, you're not going to get anywhere. So part of this is understanding your own personal biases. And again, Shivani put this in like one of her final slides regarding like um, the clinician patient interaction, for example, and um, how there can be implicit biases there. And then specifically identifying the system structures that bias against and oppress marginalized populations. My guess is if, if um, um, Shivani went on with the root cause analysis, there would be system structures at peer institutions that also um, would have led to that, that particular difference in the use of some of the new technologies for um, uh, different populations. And at the bottom there, ultimately improving uh, population health and individual health outcomes and improving equity. So that's in the lens of a healthcare system. So uh, I think in general, when you look at the SDOH diabetes literature, we tend to be, I would say, too siloed in reductionist in our approach, as opposed to being synthetic and integrative. And I think as you heard Shivani's talk, you get some sense that it is sort of this holistic integrative approach that's the reality. She has a wonderful slide 
towards the end, which was that socio-ecological model, that sort of the Russian doll model, where there were these like different umbrella aspects and circles, um, which again is synthetic integrative as opposed to being siloed reductionist. So right off the bat, we have a problem if the literature itself is basically taking the wrong frame. Um, so uh, Shivani referred to the ADA SDOH review. Um, big shout out in particular the first and senior authors, so Felicia Hill Brace and Deborah uh, Hare Joshi, who did the, the lion's share of lifting for this particular paper. Um, so I'm not going to sort of you know read the paper. It's, it's a well-written paper, extensively uh, referenced. But I would point out that um, they divide SDOH areas and interventions into these buckets: so neighborhood and physical environment, built environment, um, infrastructure for things like transportation, environmental exposures, food environment, social context, and then the linkage of healthcare to the community. And um, they basically go through different interventions. And for all of these. There are examples of interventions that have improved a variety of diabetes um, outcomes. Uh, the one at the very bottom, the linkages, there's a lot of interest right now in like, um, like screening patients for social needs, linking patients to resources in the community, feedback loops of information about the healthcare. Um, this is actually one of the areas where um, it's not a lot published yet. And so this is sort of an emerging area. There's a, a variety of published uh, funded studies. So there should be a lot coming out in the near future regarding that particular area. Um, so a year or so ago, uh, JCAM had invited me to write um, a so-called New Horizons piece where they, they want the authors to be speculative uh, in terms of predicting the future. And so I used that as an opportunity to do something similar in terms of like, you know, both reviewing the literature as well as give me a sense of where I think the field should go. Um, I would point out there's a couple of tables to, re to, to refer you to. This particular table talks about general principles for what we know um, can advance health equity. These are things that like multifactorial intervention, interventions is better than single bullet interventions, team-based care, often with nurse-led roles, uh, big robust literature for community health workers, involving patients and families and communities. Um, there's also sort of um, a, a robust literature on diabetes interventions. So everything from team-based care, population health management, e-health, community interventions, place-based interventions, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, I, I get the references for, these are most, the references there are mostly review articles in those particular areas. So for those of you um, wanting to get a further dive into any of these areas, um, this is a hopefully a helpful paper for you because in some ways it's a review reviews plus sort of advice for the future. Um, so the reference list will be um, helpful, I think. Um, and, but the basic message is that there's been a variety of these, these siloed approaches that all have had uh, various forms of uh, effectiveness. Um, and then the other report to be aware of this area, the National Academy of, of Sciences, they had the report come out a couple of years ago, me, three years ago now, uh, integrating um, social care into the delivery of health care, moving upstream to improve the nation's health. So they have these so-called five A's. So A is awareness, so identifying social risks and assets. Uh, the next two have to do at the level of the individual. So adjustment, adjusting clinical care to address social barriers, assistance, connecting those patients with social care resources. The last two uh, are at the community level, so alignment, aligning healthcare systems with community social care assets, and then advocacy. And um, I love Shivani's um, uh, last um, riff there at the end about advocacy. And, there, and she said, there's just so many ways we can advocate where there's clinical care, quality improvement, um, um, communication, um, hardcore political advocacy. Um, there's a lot of ways to be an advocate. So again, this multi-level approach, again, that Shabani had referred to with their uh, social ecological model uh, figure. Uh, and then the final reference uh, I'll give to you here is that um, I had a Nietzsche perspective come out uh, about a year ago, um, Uncomfortable Truths, what COVID-19 has revealed about chronic disease care in America. And there's a table that um, in some ways was like my one table attempt to summarize um, what we know about advancing health equity and then some, highlight some areas for the future. Let's point out a few here. Um, one we haven't talked a lot about is um, there's a lot of interest now in, in doing more than lip service for authentic community voice and authentic uh, community power sharing. So that's an emerging area. Um, another one, which I'll go into more detail, is um, particularly structural racism, which is like, again, a, 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 uh, it's always been here, but like a, it's become a, an emerging area. And NIDDK and NIH have had, for example, a couple of RFAs come out asking for structural racism um, um, projects now. Um, one thing to point out at like the very top part, um, and uh, Shivani referred to it in her nice talk about like the, the type one technologies. It's not just technology. It's really the melding of um, the human interaction, the human capital of the human interface 
with the technology. And too often, I think we tend to be too techno-centric or sometimes we'll just have a purely um, um, communication approach. It's really just the two, milling of the two. Okay, now it's my turn to be provocative and um, get us thinking about like, are we, are we basically asking the right questions and you know, it, it, is, what are the emerging research questions? Um, and so I think as, as you can tell by my, my the question here, I, I'm gonna suggest that we aren't asking the right questions and therefore our impact as researchers in the field and funders and journals has limited um, impact. Um, one of my collaborators is this brilliant um, organizational sociologist from Israel uh, Savan Spitzer Shohat. And uh, we have been commissioned by Academy Health, which is the major professional association of health service researchers, to write a paper talking about um, how can we get a field like health services research or like diabetes translation research or like social terms of health research to do as meaningful a work as possible. And this is a quote you may have heard about the old is dying and the new cannot be born uh, by Antonio Gramsci, who uh, was a political philosopher uh, from Italy in the 1930s so in the era of fascism. Um, and his point being that like um, at a certain point in time, old paradigms just don't work for the current problems, uh, but there are all kinds of forces uh, that, that uh, make it hard for new, more helpful paradigms to be born. And Savan talks about how this both internal issues within the field. So for example, within the, the, the world of diabetes research, um, there's a culture in terms of like um, the norm or what a study session in, in NADK thinks or, you know, the journal, the major diabetes journals. So there's a certain sort of like um, culture. And um, there are clashes in the, the field, these internal debates about these views. And then there's all kind of external uh, pressures too. So for example, in SDOH, I'd say that like um, uh, George Floyd police brutality, the increased interest in recognition of uh, structural racism, and then um, the COVID-19 pandemic and the increased awareness inequities are huge external factors which impact um, the diabetes SGOH area. And then um, you look at the far right, um, Savan says that like um, there's a lot of fields that basically are incremental. They'll do these sustaining interventions that are innovations, but basically just sustain the current structure. What's rare are the so-called disruptive innovations which truly change the paradigm. So I think as a whole, we tend to get stuck in very incremental change. Um, you may have seen this figure. Um, this had to do with like um, uh, persons of color and the funding rates and whatnot, but it could be applied in general to new ideas where on the left you have groupthink, and so that um, you know what gets funded is like you know what fits like the the police and the 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 the, the priests of the uh, current order versus um, if you have you know a, a true anti-racist lens or a true innovative lens, you can have a more creative uh, set of uh, grants funded, for example. Um, so again, this, we can't live racism. So um, Kamara Jones is like the master at being able to explain racism in with metaphors that are non-threatening. And she talks about three levels of racism, internalized, basically self-hatred based upon like media uh, images, personally media, which is what we tend to think about like interpersonal racism and discrimination between two people and institutionalized. So the, the structures built that we have that, that can be discriminatory. Um, so I'll give you a personal example so that um, I co-direct this Robert Wood Johnson Foundation program with Scott Cook here that funds different um, in disparity interventions. Um, we started 17 years ago and uh, we recently wrote a paper and um, part of the paper is talking about the history of the program. So when I was reading the first draft, I was telling Scott, well, you know, you're, you're being too hard on us because Scott was saying, well, we could have done better, you know. And I said to him, well, look, look, 17 years ago, um, you know, we were doing some things like we were doing interventions where there weren't a lot of interventions back then. We specifically called out race and racism. Um, this was a model from 15 years ago. You see at the very top social norms and in a company table, we specifically said on the social norms, racism, you know, the Kamara Jones um, levels and distrust of the healthcare system. Um, but then Scott had a very good reply and I had to say, you know, you're right. He said that we have really a race lens 17 years ago, as opposed to what we call a racism lens. So we would frame like questions in our face, like why do black children with asthma have higher rates of hospitalization than white children with asthma versus uh, a racism lens, which might be, why is our health system less successful helping black children with asthma avoid hospitalization than white children with asthma? The thing with the left-hand side is that when you frame it that way, it can have a sort of blame the victim approach where you start looking at individual person family factors, oftentimes uh, deficits and problems with the individual, as opposed to the lens of um, what is it about our healthcare system that basically puts black children in, that's in a position where it's very hard to succeed. 
So it takes you down different uh, roads regarding the questions you ask and the drivers you look for. And the vast majority of literature in the equity literature is very sort of person level focused, relatively little literature in terms of systems, organizations, policies. Um, I'll, I'll just briefly mention that. So it's also this process too. So like we're undergoing our own training right now in terms of anti-racism training within our own group. And I would say I am probably as guilty as the next person in terms of the times that I will do a, a microaggression, unintentional microaggression, um, which has implications in terms of then like, um, we need to create a safe, brave space in, in our working environments and all. So it's not just the technical stuff, it's this whole process by which we do research, form questions, work with a group, et cetera, and, and we can all do better with this. Um, are we using the most helpful models? Let's see. So I, I think one of the major problems is that as a field, we don't do particularly well in translating the 30,000 foot macro level concept to the practical frontline application of how these different concepts affect individual persons and communities, or we just don't do a really good job of connecting the dots and logic. So, you know, my recommendation here is think multi-level, think intersectionality, think context, think nuance. This is the NIMHD model. So it gives you a lot of different sort of like levels of influence, similar to Shivani's point. The weakness for this model is not causative in terms of showing how these relate or what's the logic model for what leads to inequities and how this all fit together. So it's not particularly useful in some ways in terms of informing interventions in terms of a logic of like why the intervention should work. Um, so here's just a really golden uh, um, diagram that uh, Shivani showed a little bit earlier. Um, so it's a great paper for uh, raising issues like trust, um, physical context, healthcare context, but again, like the field um, and all of us are including this, doesn't do a great job of then like connecting dots from those high level factors to then the mechanisms by which they then lead to impacting individuals and outcomes to inform interventions, for example. I will skip this for time. Um, I would say also too that as a whole, one of the emerging areas and one that again, it's not all that um, prevalent now, but I think will be more um, is critical theory. So understanding social problems like health inequities through analyzing systems of power that produce and reproduce them, forcing us to transcend individualist and historical perspectives that hinder accurately diagnosing the root causes of health disparities. It also involves eliminating social problems through praxis, a process of reflection and action based on critical analysis. Um, and so what's missing from the dialogue is power, because when you do the deep root cause analysis, deep dive in terms of why there were inequity problems, or why it's hard to have conversations about something like racism, it's ultimately because of power. It's control over resources, control over historical narrative, control over the framing of health inequity. So the way that power dynamics play into this is crucial, but grossly understudied. Uh, I'll skip this for a matter of time. So think mixed methods. If your ultimate goal is improving patient and population outcomes, develop skills in implementation science, translational research, communication research, payment policy, mixed method, quantitative, qualitative research, economic analysis, and then ethics. So anyone interested in sort of like um, SDOH and equity, inherently ethics are part of this. So it doesn't take much, but like a little bit of ethics exposure will take you a long way in terms of informing your research questions and work. Uh, and then this is like the sort of what I wish I had known you know, 30 years ago, no matter how good a writer you are, do more training in how to be a better writer, develop further skills in communication and storytelling, and I would say, I think as Shivani was hinting, I would specifically work on acquiring advocacy skills from people that um, are better at it than you. Um, you know, I, I can leave, leave it out here uh, for uh, the examples, but I want to leave time for discussion. I would just point out that when you hear, see examples of projects like food pantries and farmers markets and um, grocery tours and media campaigns and, and things like um, food banks and and um, outreach and all. These are very specific examples of things, but they're embedded within all the wider questions we're talking, these multi-level social uh, ecological model issues that Shivani nicely talked about. So even though they may be a micro project, it has to be viewed within a larger lens. So I'll stop there so we have some time for question and answer discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Agawal and Dr. Chin. Those were wonderful presentations. Um, I, if I may, I know we only have a little bit of time, but I wanted to ask, start with a question for Dr. Chin. Um, 
you know, I think you hit the nail on the head when you talk about multi-level, multi-pronged interventions. And, and people who do SDOH research, I think, agree with that, that, that method. I, I think the challenge is how do you think about interventions from so many of those SDOH categories? And we've categorized them. And in some ways, that alone has siloed the way we think about interventions, right? We're thinking about addressing just the physical barriers or just the healthcare barriers. But how, do you, how does one even begin to conceptualize an intervention or, or, or a, a study that is truly multi-pronged and really gets to the root cause of health inequities? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I just said that you, know, you can't do it all, right? And mm -hmm. you know, these are studies you can do over a period of time, you know, a series of studies that you're not going to sort of like you know solve it all in you know the next three years, right? So you don't feel that pressure you have to do that. But I think like the general principles are have an explicit conceptual model which includes sort of causation and like why, for example, like what's the relationship between like one level or another, and you know if you're going to address this particular level. It's going to have to make sense of like what combination of factors. But that's hard to do unless you have a you know even a simple conceptual model that can um, force you to put down the logic of, of like what you think is driving what, and therefore informing the choice of your interventions. Similarly, that will inform your evaluation, and that's why like why, why mixed methods is generally the way to go for almost you know every type of translational um, um, evaluation. Um, some things quantitative um, numbers will get gr be great at, and some you need the qualitative work to sort of fill in holes and whatnot. If I can just add to that, even though I'm not where Dr. Chin is yet, I'm aspiring to be Dr. Chin, basically. Um, I would also say in, in a lot of our grants now, I mean, even if, if, you know, I think it's choosing the right intervention is a decision based on not only impact, but feasibility, you know, and funding. And so having those those stakeholders all involved at the conversation, including the target population, right? So we had like three different interventions that we were gonna do. We talked to our young adults and we could actually do all three of these things, but what do you want first? And that's what I did and that's it. it that was enough. So just remember the target population. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions both through the Q and A and the chat. Um, so there's one question specifically for Dr. Agarwal. Thoughts on the social vulnerability index or SDOH impacts and opportunities for pre-diabetes and uh, the pre-diabetes and obesity epidemic in America's youth? Yes, um, they're basically equal, equivalent. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> um, that's my short answer. But yeah, I mean, I think. Um, just like for adult obesity, obesity and diabetes, it's just now filtered down and basically gotten worse and the exposures have gotten just, you know, more intense so that we have now pediatric issues. Um, but they're very, very closely linked. I imagine though, the, the ways we think about social determinants of health in youth are very different, right? Than the way yeah. we think about them for adults. Yeah. So thank you. So yes, I think you know it is slightly different because it's not what you know. Kids are not just individuals; they're within a family structure, and they're intergenerational family structures and units. So it is it's slightly more complicated. So who do you? You can't just intervene on the kids. You have to intervene on the the family unit as well, and and neighborhoods. You know, schools. Thank you. It looks like we have two minutes left. Um, there's one question in the chat that uh, is asking to expand. I think this is pressed for both of you on reasons why pancreas transplant is not offered. Um, and, and perhaps it, it may be in the context of, of access to healthcare utilization, um, but I'm extrapolating here a little bit. Well, I'll look through some general points. This is the area of Shamana. You, you probably know much more than I do. Um, yeah. I would say sort of a broad perspective. Like, like I think from a societal perspective, um, I would think about like this, the, the variety of factors that are driving inequities 
And some of it's going to be a value proposition. So I do a lot of work with like health plans and, and, and payers like state Medicaid and whatnot. And so they, of course they have their limited budgets and they're thinking about like, where can I have the bang for the buck? Um, I would get that, I would guess that that's part of the reason in terms of then like some of their funding decisions. Um, but you know, from a societal perspective, that'd be something that um, the major stakeholders would be thinking about, just like how, how what's the best use of like um, their limited resources. Yeah, um, and just to add, I mean, so pancreas transplant is not without risks, um, and it's a very, very costly, resource-intensive procedure. So institutions that can do pancreas transplants often have a lot of startup costs that are not going to be possible at many institutions, academic or not academic. Um, there's a lot of regulatory um, barriers, um, so it is. And then the you know the the actual medications you have to take to avoid rejection can actually cause issues on their own. So it is not without risk, and so I have a feeling that's probably limiting widespread use as well. Great, thank you very much. Um, it looks like we're right at time. I want to uh, thank both of our speakers so much for your time and your wonderful presentations and to all our participants today who have um, joined. And Elisabetta, do you have any last words? Thanks so much, uh, the, our two speakers, fantastic presentations. And thank you, Sonia, for you know, putting all the people in, in the room for today. It was a fantastic discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.